Okay, chapter 14, training muscles to become stronger. Today we're, uh, we're going to describe the following four methods to assess muscular strength. Cable tensiometry, dynamometry, one rep max, computer assisted isokinetic dynam dynamometry uh, outline. Procedure to assess one rep max for bench press leg and leg press. Explain how to ensure test standardization, fairness, uh, when evaluating muscular strength. Compare absolute and relative upper and lower body muscular strength in women, when men and women. Find concentric, eccentric, isometric muscle actions, including examples of each. Recommend appropriate frequency overload and sets and repetitions for dynamic exercise resistance training. Explain the specificity of training response for muscular strength related to enhanced performance in sports and occupational tasks. Compare isokinetic resistance training to conventional dynamic and static resistance training. Uh, describe rationale, the rationale for plyometric training to improve muscular strength and power. Give examples of exercises for these purposes. Indicate how psychological and muscular factors influence maximum strength capacity. Outline major physiological adaptations to re uh, resistance training, develop circuit resistance training, program to improve muscular strength and aerobic fitness simultaneously. We're also going to describe tests to assess muscular endurance for the abdominals and chest shoulder areas and describe uh, delayed onset muscle soreness, DOMS, related to type 2-1, the type of exercise most frequently assess, uh, associated with DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness, uh, and best way to minimize the delayed onset muscle soreness uh, effects when becoming when beginning a training program and three cellular factors related to DOMS. Resistance training areas. Um, uh, first of all, one one of the things is uh, Peter Hendrick Ling. Uh, he was one of the one of the, much of the science of strength development at the time is attributed to him. That comes from chapter one, but uh, in the 1840s, strong men uh, were seen to be, they were, they were showcasing their pro, uh, prowess in car carnivals and sideshows and things like that. Uh, Ling is known as the father of, Swe uh, father of Swedish medicine, or Swedish gymnastics, excuse me. And um, he uh, founded the current Swedish School of uh, Sport and Health Sciences. Uh, and he and his son, Halmar Ling, uh, were influential writers and practitioners during the genesis of early movement science. So I thought I'd note those two individuals. Uh, Gustav Zander also was one of the, was, he was, he developed the first machines for fitness equipment. This is on page 435. Uh, and these strength machines um, were mechanical apparatuses that were, became the prototypes of what equipment are now. Um, in resistance training, one of the things that's important to understand is that what are the objectives of resistance training? Okay, you need to start with the end in mind. What is the mission during what you're doing, right? What is it? Is it to lift weight to become uh, the strongest? Okay, now remember weightlifting, if you talk about uh, power, power has is weight. Power is work, which equals uh, force times dis force mi uh, force times distance over time. So the time component is is a part of the power. Okay, strength by itself is force times displacement. Uh, but the reason I'm mentioning these things is because the different people work out, lift weights for different reasons. Okay, bodybuilding, which is uh, maximizing muscular development for aesthetic goals or way things the person just looks. Okay. How does someone look? General strength training. Okay. Fitness and health enhancement. Physical therapy. So rehab from injury or disease. Sport specific resistance training, which is basically uh, maximizing sport performance. And then muscle physiology, understanding the structure and function uh, and, and that's why people do uh, resistance training. So this isn't really essential to know why you're doing what you do because these are different things and you train differently and eat differently relative to it. Types of muscle action, the concent concentric, eccentric, isometric, dynamic, constant, external resistance. So contract concentric 
basically is um, the muscles are shortening to produce tension through a range of motion. Eccentric is uh, the external resistance exceeds muscle, uh, muscle force, and this is also called lengthening or even plyometrics. Asymmetric is uh, when a muscle generates force and attempts to shorten but can't overcome external resistance. So this is like pushing against the wall. Uh, you're not really making it move anywhere, so but there's still pressure. Okay, there's no displacement, there's still force. And then dynamic constant external resistance implies external weight or resistance remains constant throughout the movement. So it's the constant uh, tension throughout the movement. Okay, and you have A, we have concentric, okay. Uh, B, uh, B is isometric, excuse me, C is isometric. Um, and if you have uh, B there, B is it's going downward, that's eccentric. Okay. All right, so you have um, mus measurement of muscular strength. Muscular strength is max force tension torque generated by muscle and muscle groups. Isometric muscle ten uh, testing. Muscle force is measured at a specific joint angle by tens a cable tensiometer, dun uh, dynamo dynamometer, computer assisted devices. These are the isometric tests. And this is on page uh, 438. And this talks about the measuring of muscular strength to, to, to see how much these tensiometers, dynamometer, to see the, the ability, um, measurement of static strength by these certain things. Um, eccentric, concentric muscle strength, you have one rep max. So you choose initial, initial weight, but below max lifting capacity, and you keep adding one to five kilograms to, until you, uh, between the set, um, in the rest one to five minutes to see. So you add progressively to the previous attempt until the person reaches max lifting capability. Okay, so you have 10 rep, 10 rep max. So how many times can you only do it for 10? It's your maximum of 10, maximum five, and maximum once. Okay, 100% is percent of maximum, percent of maximum is one rep max. So percent of maximum, you have 90% of the one rep max is five, at whatever weight that is. And then 10 reps of is about 75% of what that one rep max is. Consu uh, con computer assisted electromagnetic mechan electromechanical isokinetic determination. You have this uh, exercise equipment that uh, intensifies this, uh, quantifies, excuse me, muscular force and power during a variety of movements. Isokinetic denomometer is, um, is electromechanical accommodating resistance instrument, speed control mechanism. So basically it's constant velocity and force throughout the whole movement, uh, on the whole entire movement arm. And uh, the reason this is done is so that you can, um, I could, I say, this is done so that throughout the whole range of motion there's constant uh, force, okay? And an example of that is on page uh, 445, you have an iso isokinetic uh, electromechanical dynam dynamometer, which is a Biodex advanced isokinetic electromechanical dyna dy dynamometer. Um, so uh, it can, it, you know, it, 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 it aids people in, in it to, to increase that, pre keep that force throughout the full range of motion, okay? Because in, in weight training, in the concentric, concentric phase, there's, a portion of it that where there's the forces um, the force does not remain constant let's let me just say that over the whole entire range of the movement in like weight training versus the isokinetic uh, type of uh, resistance training strength um, testing considerations um, you want to standardize instructions prior to testing for individuals ensure uniformity duration intensity of warm-up provide adequate Practice prior to the test of minute, to test uh, minimize learning that can compromise initial results. Um, so you want to make sure they practice enough so that they know what they're doing and the learning isn't affecting the baseline. And then ensure consistency among subjects and the angle of limb measurement and or body position. So you want on test uh, to, on the test device. You want to make sure that people who you're measuring are similar if you're gonna. Um, and if they're not, then they may require different uh, um, weights or uh, starting points. Strength uh, testing considerations. Um, you need to pre predetermine a minimum number of trials or reps 
to establish criterion a strength score, score um, you need to select test measures with high test reproducibility. Okay, so if you implement some type of um, test, you want to get this. If I give the test or if you give the test to, to a client, let's say that you would get the same type of results, which is high test re reproducibility and reliability. Recognize individual differences in body size composition when evaluating strength scores amongst individuals and groups because, um, you know, you have specificity, but you also have diversity of the people who you're actually train, training. So there's, um, there may be individual differences, body size, composition, things like that, um, when you look at strength scores and things like that. Um, so that some of it's relative to, to, to weight. Um, okay. Uh, so if you have a relative strength, for instance, someone is heavier and they're lifting more weight than someone who weighs less, their relative strength score actually might be lower, okay, versus the absolute, which is how much they're lifting versus someone who may be lighter who's lifting less, but yet, based upon their body weight, the person with the lower body weight actually may actually be stronger, which deals with relative strength. Um, training muscles have become stronger. Your muscle strengthens when trained near uh, its current max force generating capacity. Importantly, overload intensity, level of tension placed in muscle, not the type of exercise that applies overload generally governs strength improvements. Okay. Um, so intensity is what matters uh, very, uh, very greatly. Uh, and then progressive resistance weight training, isometric training, and isokinetic training, three common exercise systems to train muscles to become stronger. So you have progressive resistance where you keep adding weight, okay, to... Um, to, to have that progressive overload, you have isometric training, which is pushing against an object that's usually not moving, like the wall, or things where you're um, you're not strength, you're not lengthening or shortening the muscle. And isokinetic, where you're dealing with that machine-based, the force that's uh, the velocity that remains constant throughout the range of motion. Strength training principles and guidelines. So you have overload intensity, um, muscles respond to intensity of overload rather than the form, okay? Um, amount of overload reflects percentage of one rep max. Minimal intensity of muscular overload occurs between 60 to 70 percent of one rep max. Three approaches apply to this muscular overload. You have an increase in load or resistance, or you have increase in reps, keeping the load the same, let's say weight the same, or increasing the speed of the muscle action, how fast you're doing that action okay so then there's something called the force velocity relationship that comes into effect which is that uh, absolute or peak force generated movement depends on the speed of the muscle length and shortening so you have muscle short shortening and lengthening um, at different max velocities um, depending on the load placed on them as load increases max shortening velocity decreases so what that's saying is is that uh, you know, um, training intensity represents the most important factor in strength development, requires uh, current training above the max threshold. Um, but when, it, when, you're, when you're talking about, um, when you increase weight, you're going to decrease the velocity, okay? Uh, that's just how it works. It's, it's the force velocity relationship. And a muscle's force generating capacity rapidly declines with increased shortening velocity. So if you increase the speed, Typically, you're going to have to decrease the what the force because you're you can you can do less you can do less weight more reps or more weight less reps makes sense okay um, and what you have is you have a max force velocity relationship for shortening strength and muscle action so rapid shortening velocities generate the least max force shortening velocity becomes zero when the curve crosses the y-axis force generating capacity increases to the highest when the muscle lengthens at rapid velocities. So that's what this talks about here. Just um, basically, it's uh, the shortening velocity becomes zero, or max isometric force when the curve crosses the y-axis. So this is what's talking about this lengthening and shortening. So um, when the force goes up, you have this. Uh, when the force is, it goes up, you end up having um, it slows the velocity down. Is really what we're talking about here. So, and then you talk about this uh, in inverted U shape. Inverted is upside down U on the uh, figure 14.7. 
between muscles max power output and limb movement so you have the sweet spot where power and uh, the speed of limb movement is creating the greatest degree of muscle power but that happens at a specific angular velocity where if it's too fast then it actually de you decline the muscle you, your muscle power declines so peak power rapidly increases when increasing velocity peak re velocity region and after that max power decreases because of the reduced max force and faster movement speed. So you have to do something quickly enough, okay, to be able to increase the power, okay, at a certain rate where it's efficient. But if you go too quickly, you're, it, it's not, you're not, you're gonna knock, you're basically not, it's gonna be too fast and it's gonna reduce max force. Each muscle group has optimum movement speed to produce max power. And that's what this is here. See, it's a sweet spot right there in the middle where you have power and speed of limb movement. Low repetition relationship, total work accomplished, muscle action depends on load resistance place of the muscle. Air from 60 to 100% 60 to one rep max represents strength training zone. Training stimulus optimizes strength improvement. So 60 to 100, you have, within that, you have hypertrophy training, which is like 60 to 70% of one rep max. Then you have about 70 to 95 percent of strength training where you decrease the repetitions increase the weight so strength training zone right here this is where you build strength 60 percent 60 100 percent one rep max absolute muscle strength we talked about this is that um one of these things is so how, how strong are you okay women score about 50 percent lower than men in upper body strength at about 30 percent lower than leg strength so it's more equitable with between men and women with lower uh, body strength than it is upper body. Um, comparisons of muscular strength and absolute score indicate men possess generally greater strength than women. All muscle groups tested. What well, makes sense? I mean, men have more androgens. I mean, <clears throat> which actually so then that increases the you know the has has to deal with uh, that that it correlates with increased. Um, muscle cell diameter which then if then that that would that parallels a lot of times how much force can be produced through by that okay by that muscle for action um so if that happens then you would think oh the size is larger than muscle muscular strength correlates to it um gender differences so computes in one of three variables body mass so you have strength score in pounds divided by body mass um in pounds so this is relative. What I said before is that relative means you factor in the body weight. So how strong is someone? Well, this this guy's really strong, but he's a really big guy. Weighs a lot of weight. Well, weighs a lot of pounds. Well, this other individual is smaller, but he can lift more, let's say, for his body mass. So he could actually, in relative muscle strength, he could be he could actually have a higher relative muscle strength in regard when compared to absolute, which is just weight lifted. Um, segmental or total fat, uh, fat free mass you have strength score in pounds divided by mass in pounds excuse me you have strength score in pounds divided by the fat mass okay and then you have muscle cross-sectional area which is strength score in pounds divided by muscle cross-sectional area okay relative score increases fairness when comparing two individual strength performances makes sense this here just talks about strength training with children and um, basically there's Neural adaptation and muscular and even muscular strength, even with low androgens, low testosterone, um, causes an increase in strength for children. Uh, you know, they they do have incomplete uh, incomplete skeletal development, and there's concern raised about this. But unless they're doing bodybuilding, there's limited evidence that actually um, shows negative of their negatives of uh resistance training in children meaning resistance training in children is actually a, has shown benefits okay um and there's not uh really any adverse adverse effects of bone or muscle but then you're also talking about high repetitions concentric only muscle actions okay you're not talking about high resistance low reps okay so if we're talking about this you know they can get stronger um, some of it's the majority, a lot of it's neuro, neuro adaptation because they don't have the androgens. However, um, one of the interesting things is on page, uh, let's see here, continue on here. 
Hmm. Uh, muscular strength and puberty. It's on page 464. You have, until puberty, boys maintain about 10% greater muscular strength than girls. After 12, uh, boys continue to increase strength while strength plateaus in girls. So, it says strength changes in body composition account much for these strength differences. Obviously, after puberty, they, boys have more uh, androgens release, testosterone, things like that. Um, and you know, this is this is this is an obvious thing. You know, you have the, the luteinizing hormone it affects the gonads, which then increases testosterone. But uh, before puberty, this doesn't isn't really the case. So the question is then is why do our boys about ten percent greater muscular strength than girls? I mean, um, before puberty, and it may have to do with the, the neuro adaptation of, of doing the weight training, um, and it also and, and also a little bit of muscular strength development. Um, through uh, through this as well, even though there's a lack of androgens. Um, so, muscular strength training systems. You have isometric training, dynamic consistent, external resistance train, uh, resistance training, variable resistance, isokinetic, plyometric, body weight. Um, many of the uh, systems of strength training have been developed over the past several centuries. Uh, so. What we're going with here is we're on page uh, 452. Um, so these are these are interrelated uh, systems, but it's it's they're all they all have there's benefits to each. Okay, so isometric static training. So you have, um, for instance, this uh, it, it gained popularity over a ten year period beginning in 1955. Research in Germany. Uh, during this time, showed five percent weekly increase in isometric strength from uh, only one day. Two thirds max isometric action for six seconds duration. Um, repeating this action five to ten times further increased measured um, isometric strength. Um, so, the, the, this the, this this research also showed that gains in strength from isometrics were related to repetitions, duration of muscle action, and training frequency. A drawback. Uh, basically involves difficulty in monitoring exercise intensity and training results because there's essentially no external movement occurring during the muscle action so it becomes difficult to determine objectively the person's strength if the person's strength improves or whether the person applies an appropriate overload force during training one of the uh so you have these things here and it says um uh, also, the one day of isometric action does not increase isometric training strength as effectively as repeated actions, and isometric training does not provide consistent stimulus for muscular hypertrophy, which is muscle size diameter increase. Um, you have uh, gains in isometric strength could predominantly could occur. Isom, uh, gains in isometric strength can occur predominantly at the joint angle used in training. Also. Isometric benefits. Uh, this is this uh, this 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 strength happens over a joint angle, so through the range of motion. So isometric training works well in orthopedic and physical therapy applications that isolate strengthening movements during rehab. Isometric measurement pinpoints area of muscle weakness. Isometric training strengthens muscles at the appropriate joint angle in the range of motion, so it could help in regards to rehab. So let's talk about here. Difficulty monitoring exercise, benefits, orthopedic physical therapy, uh, strength particular mus particular muscle group, uh, applied isometric force covers four or five joint angles for range of motion. Next we have dynamic consistent external resistance training, or DCER, which really talks about weightlifting, uh, resistance training um, with barbells, dumbbells, exercise machines um, with different muscular overload strategies. This uh, took place progressive resistance training. Following World War II, rehab medicine uh, researchers devised a research training method to improve the force generating capacity of previously injured muscles and limbs. Their method in involved three sets of uh, resistance exercise, each consisting of 10 reps done consecutively, consecutively without rest. First set involved one half of the max weight lifted 10 times, or one half, to, or one half 10 rep max. Second set used three quarters 10 rep max, and the final set required maximum weight for 10 reps or 10 rep max. 
As patients increase strength, the resistance increased periodically to match strength improvements. So then this te technique is really called the progressive resistance uh, exercise of pre-RE, which is the practical application of overload principle, which forms the basics, basis of most current, current resistance training programs. Okay. Um, uh, for those wishing to max, maximize muscular strength and size gains, higher volume, multiple set, multiple set paradigms, emphasizing six to twelve rem, six to twelve rep max at moderate velocity, with one to two minute rest between sets, most uh, prove most effective. And um, novices and intermediates train two to three days a week, whereas advanced exercisers train three to four days a week and sometimes more. So the high tr high training and frequency extends the transient um, or changeable uh, activation uh, of inflammatory signaling cascades, concomitant with persistent suppression and key mediators of anabolic response. Um, so, which could blunt the training response. One of the things that this is talking about here is that if you uh, If, if you work out the same muscles too many times per week, uh, <clears throat> what happens is your glycogen stores can um, be substantially cut down. And also you're, you're breaking down your muscle fibers uh, so that inadequate, inadequate recovery takes place and it retards the uh, neuromuscular and structural adaptations and strength gains. If you do too many, let's say you lift biceps twice a week, I mean, you're sore from that on... The next day on Tuesday when you did biceps Monday and it, it actually inhibits strength okay so these are things you have to, to think about in regards to this type of thing um, responses of men and women are dynamic consist, uh, constant external resistance training uh, women achieved higher percentage of strength improvement than men in this one study although considerable overlap occurs exists between sex comparisons so basically the findings indicate the relative equality um, between men and women in trainability, okay, with short uh, duration resistance training. Um, we've talked variable resistance training. Um, this is the third one we're talking about alters the external resistance um, to movement by using a lever arm, a regular shaped metal cam, hydraulics, air, or pulley to match. Uh, increases and decreases in force capacity related to joint angle and hence lever characteristics through the range of motion. This allows near maximal force production throughout the full range of motion, which is pretty cool. So this adjustment based on average physical di uh, dimensions of a population uh, facilitates strength gains because it allows near maximum force production. So, so this is the one that basically um, causes, um, if this is like, a, this is um this is uh, this facilitates strength gains because theoretically it um, you have the max force production the, the whole entire time that you pick up from the start to the start to the start to stop of the activity. Okay, isokinetic resistance training this employs muscle action performed at constant angular limb velocity. Isokinetic device controls movement velocity. Muscles exert max forces through range of motion, shortening. A specific velocity. This is what I talked about when I said look at an example is on page 445 you have the biodex isokinetic electromagnetic uh, me uh, mechanical dyna dynamometer figure 14 14.5 in this is a force throughout a range of motion it's continual um, at a continual ve velocity okay um, you exert max force throughout the full range of motion, optimize the strength development. Concentric only action, so it minimizes potential for muscle and joint injury and pain because, as, as we know, eccentric muscle action is what causes a lot of damage, a lot of the injuries that can take that take place. Um, plyometrics, this is another pretty cool uh, resistance training type activity where you're dealing with ex plyometrics training or explosive jump training. Um, deals with stretch and load stretch then you load muscle suddenly so you have the stretch then recoil or the myotatic uh, re reflex which is rapid stretching then shortening okay so um, some of these things exercises range in difficulty from calf jumps off the ground with the rebounding jump to multiple leg jumps 
or to and from boxes ranging in height. So you might jump on top of a box and then jump down quickly, then back up on top of, to, of a box. But really what it deals with is an in, eccentric movement than a concentric. Basic principle for all jumping and plyometric exercises, absorb the shock with arms or legs, then immediately contract the muscles. So if you do a series of squat jumps, a person should jump again as quickly into the air as possible. So if you do a squat jump, then quickly jump. Squat jump, then quickly jump. Okay, so you're doing with like thrusting, uh, even with both heels up to the to the buttocks. So you jump and you kick your heels up to your butt and go, go land again with the eccentric, and then you jump up and you do the concentric with the jump again. And what it does, in essence, a fast, fast plyometric exercise trains the neural pathways to respond quickly and activate muscles rapidly. Um, so plyometric maneuvers avoid the disadvantage of having to decelerate mass in the latter part of the joint range of motion during fast uh, during a fast movement, and uh, which provides uh, max power. Okay. One of the things that, that this is, talks about is the ballistic bench throw. Um, it's kind of so it's traditional bench press versus um, the uh, ballistic bench throw. So at the end of the bench press, you're throwing it almost up in the air. You're pro projecting the barbell into the, into the air. And it, um, it's interesting because uh, this is on figure 14.4. They talk about, look at this. It says bar position relative to total concentric movement, mean bar velocity related to total concentric movement for bench throw and traditional bench press performed rapidly so you have the velocity goes up okay um, and then you have total concentric movement okay but the, the argument here is basically that you have uh, what happened what happened with this is it says the results were unequivocal so um, during the standard bench deceleration begins at about 60% of the bar position relative to total concentric movement in the contrast, velocity during the bench throw continues throughout the range of motion, remains higher at all bar positions following uh, movement. Translating into a higher, into a greater average force, average power, and peak power output, achieving faster average and peak velocity throughout the range of motion, produces greater power uh, output and muscle activation assessed by an EMG electromyography nerve study is what it is with a needle goes in the muscle than traditional weightlifting exercise movement so and this is essential this is this is pretty cool stuff because the throw condition produced greater muscle activity for the pectoralis major plus 19 percent anterior deltoid uh, plus 34 percent triceps brachii 44 percent and biceps brachii 27 percent so that's pretty um those results are pretty unbelievable the difference between the ballistic uh the, uh, the the uh, ballistic uh, bench throw versus traditional traditional bench, so it's it's actually been shown to be much more effective, okay, in producing um, the average power, average force, and it's pretty awesome stuff. Okay, um, this by the way, plyometrics were plyometrics came into effect uh, with. Uh, uh, it was a Russian um, type of act of uh, that was developed in, in, in Russia, and it was it was uh, something that caused um, they sh they saw a lot of of, of great uh, power uh, increases relative to it. Yeah. Okay, this is what we're talking about with the starting position, jump onto the box. So you have, okay, so you have concentric up onto the box, eccentric down. And then you have again another concentric, okay, jump again. Body weight loaded training, also known as closed connect chain suspension training, introduced added component of instability for the challenge the trunk. Okay, we have that's over. And this this is this is the uh, this is where you have your your cables. Okay, trying to get back to where we're at here. Okay, this is a bodyweight loaded training, page 457. Um, gain popularity, it's, it's, you have an end of it. So basically you have an um, example of bodyweight supported push-up. You, you have the arms and slings. They're not in contact with the surface of the floor, bearing the person's body weight, activating both agonist and antagonist muscles about, about a joint, um, in, including the additional muscle groups along the kinetic chain. So you have to have 
um, trunk stability and bass, buck back muscle neuromuscular control as well. Um, and this role of uh, perturbation basically during relatively simpler complex movements plays a key role in training the intricate signaling patterns that control basic human movement. Um, so it's like a suspension type thing. It's pretty cool. Um, specificity of training response. Um, so isometric strength developed at or near one joint angle doesn't really transfer to other angles or body positions using the same muscles. In contrast, muscles trains dynamically through the movement over limited range of motion, so greatest improvement when measured in range of motion. Um, so dynamic resistance training um, doesn't demonstrate equal improvement in force capacity when measured isometrically or uh, isokinetically. Functional strength training or functional resistance movement training um, to improve specific Physical performance through resistance training that's important to train muscles and movements that mimic the movements requiring force capacity improvement. Focus on force velocity power requirements rather than simply isolated joint muscle action. So you have people who, what this is, is talking about sports specific training really. Okay. You, you really, your training must reflect what you're going to be doing. So if you're doing certain weight bearing activities that aren't strengthening the musculature or even um, that's going to lead to then the sport performance, it doesn't really make sense. Um, because uh, strength and neuromuscular development or dynamic training through the full uh, range of motion is a sport uh, deals with sport specific training. So um, it's functional strength training or functional resistance movement. Um, and to, to train a specific muscle group, the muscles, to train specific muscle or a group of muscles, the coach and athlete must carefully assess the muscle groups involved in a particular movement. Um, training should develop max force generating capacity for the muscles to the range of motion and a movement pattern and speed it closely mimics actual sports performance. Okay, um, and I talked about this one here. Um, isometric training can't accomplish this goal because no limb movement occurs and isokinetic actions provide max overload potential at diverse movement velocities because movement speed uh, with the electromechanical uh, dynamometers approaches 400 degrees per second but even if you're doing it at that velocity uh, it doesn't mimic the movement that that occurs during some sports which the limb velocity approaches 2,000 degrees per second okay so that's why um, the strength training and things like that have to try you have to try to uh, for practical applications to take place you want to have nervous and muscular systems that are uh, uh, Going to, going to have some type of carryover to what is you're training this uh, muscular system, muscular groups for. That's basically what it is. What's this talking about? Periodization. Um, there's macro meso cycles with that. Macro is large, meso is small. There's four four parts that are discussed on page four fifty nine. Um, when you manipulate um, intensity, volume, frequency, and sets and repetitions and rest periods, that's what really. Um, you're dealing with with periodization and, and periodization as time goes on the volume goes down and the intensity goes up but what you have is four phases. you have the prep phase which is hypertrophy phase which is eight to twelve reps three to five sets transition phase five to six reps three to six three to five sets this is like a power uh, strength development in, in the first transition phase competition phase uh, let's peak participant peak for co competition and you have low volume, high intensity workouts, three to five sets, only two to four reps, 90 to 95% one rep max. And then um, in, in sports specific exercises during this competition phase. And then you have the uh, active recovery, which, um, and in competition phase, you have sort of increased intensity, decreased volume. And then active recovery, like I said, the fourth phase is like the cross training or recreational activities that come post season. And that's really what this talks about here. And it talks about here too as well. So you can read through that, and that's on page 459. Uh, practical, re practical recommendation for initiating the resistance training program avoid max lifts at the beginning stages because you need to know form before you end up going trying to do heavier weight. So lighter resistance, more repetitions, start training. After several weeks, training decreased repetitions uh, to between six and eight. So then you're dealing with more power. Okay. Add more resistance after each target number. 
exercise sequence should proceed larger to smaller muscle groups avoid premature fatigue of smaller groups um, some of the things that play roles is you have genetics nervous system activation environmental factors endocrine hormonal influences you know testosterone levels things like that uh, nutritional status macronutrients micronutrients and physical activity um, that you have you participated before have you done things before or or not Practical recommendations for initiating training program. You have in the beginning you have neural adaptation, you have strength, you have hypertrophy, and then hypertrophy and neural adaptations lim uh, plateau, and even strength. And then some people take um, PEDs, steroids, things like that to increase even further muscular size and then strength. And but that doesn't come without side effects, which is yeah. You, know, you really have to ask ask yourself what is the benefit of something if over time it's going to be detrimental. And practical, resistance, uh, practical recommendations for initiating so resistance training. What are the physiological adaptations? You have muscle fibers. You have increase in size. Um, type is unknown. You don't. You know, it's some. Sometimes it's it's been shown to, to increase the per, uh, percentage of type two if you're doing resistance training, decreasing type one. But those are um, those are not definitive studies. Um, you have. Now they can change within the like I said before. If you have two, a lot of type two B um, fast twitch B fibers, and you start doing distance running, you're gonna then transition to to having more type two A, which are more oxidative fibers. Um, so mitochondria decrease. Why? Because obviously you're dealing with the resistance training anaerobic system, not the aerobic um, enzymes of glycolysis. They increase because you're dealing with carbohydrate metabolism, glycolysis, anaerobic. Um, aerobic, um, so you have you still have the carbohydrates you know, increase obviously because that's what's the primary energy source of the um, primary energy source of, of the uh, resistance training, and then you have other things such as cross sectional area of bone, no uh, no change, but then you have mineral content increase and resistance to fracture. Okay, you have certain things that that um. Uh, then you have, look at connective tissue. So you have ligament strength, tendon strength. Obviously, it's increasing. And those increase to meet the requ the, uh, the needs of the resistance training that you're doing. Adaptations, resistance training. You have neural adaptations, development, and how well untrained person recruits more motor units, achieving ma uh, max muscle action, increased synchronization of motor unit firing, causing more units to fire. Um, Simultaneously, so these are two things that basically cause um, th these cause the uh, motor unit activation um, to to, uh, to to give for that to, to great, give a greater force and things like that that that's needed to uh, lift the muscle or lift the weight. Excuse me. Um, is there anything else? Uh, no, I talked a little bit about great synchronization. This is what happens. Neural adaptation happens actually before puberty and actually after the certain age where men and women lose testosterone. Men, women even have testosterone, but the reality is neural, neural adaptation, someone starts lifting weights later as they age, like in their mid midlife or 40 or 50 years old, you know, the, they get better at things based on neural adaptations because androgens are, have, have decreased in men after 30 and things like that. And then before, before puberty, Neural adaptations is what causes individuals to do increase in weight and things like that because of the fact that the androgens, once again, um, that's not the primary source of muscular strength because they're not; it's not there. Um, adaptations, just training, muscular adaptations, and muscle fiber hypertrophy growth take place from increased amount of contractile proteins, number of size of myofibrils, per, uh, per muscle fiber, increased amounts of connective tendinous, ligamentous tissues, Remember, uh, we have the tendon, that's muscle to bone, but ligaments bone to bone. And it, obviously, that's going to increase because it's, it's trained to lift more weight. You have number and size of minor fibrils or muscle fibers, okay, per muscle fiber. And, and, and that's because you have genetic regulation where it, it is trying to meet the need um, of what's going on. So then you have this these satellite cells, and it's in the literature, but it's in 469 talking about your proliferation of the satellite cells that differentiate to then basically these 
um, genes that they're switched on to then cause these these increased number and size of myofibrils from muscle fi uh, fiber. Um, growth also takes place from increased uh, contractile proteins because obviously that is also in need um, relative to the exercises that, that are taking place, the resistance training that's taking place in modality, which is the weight training. Um, and increased quantity of enzymes and stored nutrients. So, connective tissue, bone adaptations, ligaments, ten tendons, bones. Um, you have. Uh, you, you okay? So let, let me let me go back here. One of the things I want to say: muscle fiber hypertrophy. So I, I talked about this before, but that's. Hypertrophy is best done with about eight to twelve repetitions of three to four sets. Okay, of so eight to twelve of your one rep max, three to four sets with about thirty to to a minute rest in between each set. So you're basically increasing muscle size. That's the best way to do that. By the way, you have a lot increased in uh, high intensity, which increases the growth hormone release. Then you have also, you're having 8 to 12 repetitions, which is the best way to increase the muscle diameter, okay? So, connective tissue, bone tissue, out of bone adaptations, ligaments, tendons, bones correspondingly strengthen as muscle strength and size increases. Um, and this makes sense because it's going to have to main, uh, um, these are all going to have to grow to correspond to this muscle size and strength. Connective tissue proliferates around individual Muscle fibers thickens, think, thickens, strengthens as uh, muscle connective tissue structures. Also, bones. The so it's called um, uh, the um, collagen in the long bones grows thicker, which then uh, calcifies, turns the bones. And this is weight bearing activity. A lot of it's doing to muscle. So weight bearing, squatting, things like that will then cause your tibia fibula uh, to grow. Uh, relative to the pressure that's that's basically placed on it, set up such adaptations for resistance training help protect joints, muscles from injury, justify resistance exercise for preventative and rehab strategies. Cardiovascular adaptations, physiological hypertrophy of the heart wall. Now, your left ventricular hypertrophy. People look at that and say, "Oh, that must be bad." You know, high blood pressure over time causes it. Yeah. It does, it could lead to heart failure, but this is a different, this is, it, it's very similar, okay, but it's a nuance, it's different. Left ventricular wall uh, is actually larger because of the strength that's been gained through the resistance training, so the heart gets stronger. Same thing, they're a little different physiological adaptation, but a lot of, but to uh, endurance training and left ventricular uh, function as well, but these are different then. This growth is different than heart enlargement due to uh, uh, disease that is based upon uh, uh, lack of movement, okay, and, and other dietary problems. Uh, so, resistance exercise more acutely increases blood pressure and lower intensity dynamic movements, okay? So, it's, it's what happens systolic and diastolic go up during resistance training. Remember, in endurance training, you only had you had systolic go up, but diastolic remained relatively uh, same than as at rest. But it doesn't produce any long-term increase in resting blood pressure. And this is what it talks about here, which is at rest, blood pressure, diastolic, systolic, decrease, no change. One of the things um, is that obviously exercise heart rate goes up, blood pressure. It says here decrease, decrease, but actually blood pressure. This should say blood pressure increases during exercise during resistance training. Okay, obviously, blood pressure increases both systolic and diastolic. I should not say that's an error in the book. Um, so these are just things to think about. Uh, body composition adaptations, small decreases occur in body fat, minimal increases in total body mass and fat-free mass. So you have resistance training uh, does increase fat-free mass. So that's why I said, oh, this person is gaining weight, but they're lifting weights. Okay, yes, fat-free mass, not fat. So it's good weight gained, all right. Uh, and to, to 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 monitor weight increases, um, if you're doing aerobic training as opposed to resistance training, that mo that basically um, aerobic training keeps your weight at a certain uh, level. 
uh, weight training is going to increase your weight a little bit because of fat-free mass that's gained. But fat-free mass, what happens is it actually raises your basal metabolic rate because your, break, your fat-free mass increases, you're lifting weights, you're breaking down fibers, which have to be then fixed over the next few days after weight training. So then you, it increases your body's energy requirement to fix those mic microfiber tears. So that's why it's imperative to have aerobic training and resistance training in your workout so that you're firing on all cylinders, decrease, uh, you know, burning calories now and also having calories burn the next few days after and increasing your fat-free mass after weight training. Largest fat-free mass increase is about two, three kilograms over 10 weeks. Results about the same for, for men and women. No one resistance training system uh, proves superior for changing body composition. And delayed onset muscle soreness, which basically t is the, the, this is how sore you get a few days after your workout, okay? And this is because you have the minute tears and muscle tissue damage, contractile components, osmotic pressure changes that cause fluid retention, muscle spasms, overstretching, perhaps tearing up portions of muscles, connective tissue are harness, and then inc acute inflammation. You have alt uh, alteration cells uh, mechanism for calcium regulation and combined of all the factors above. So you have soreness right after, but then this delayed onset muscle soreness happens uh, a day, you know, it's, it, it happens in a delayed uh, manner and it's based on the tearing of the fibers that, that through the uh, resistance training that you did. But it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it's, um, like I said, it, it this, 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 um, healing of these fibers that takes energy, which then is beneficial for you when you're not moving uh, the next day. Let's say you're sitting in a chair. Body's still burning uh, calories, increasing that basal metabolic rate. And then you have here some of the factors you have what, well, first of all, eccentric muscle actions can cause this delayed onset muscle soreness or injury, um, high muscle force damage, sarcolemma, which deals with the calcium, okay. and um, that's another factor. Damage to muscle contractile myofibrils, muscle fibers, non-contractile non -contractile structures. You have, you know, certain things like ligaments that don't have much blood supply, and those are problems too that can take place. Metabolites, calcium accumulate abnormal levels, produce more cell damage, and, and reduce force capacity. Late onset muscle soreness considered to result from inflammation, tenderness, pain, and then inflammation process begins. Muscle cell heals. At a, uh, the adaptive process makes muscle cell more resistant to damage from subsequent exercise. Also, the, one of the things too is it should hormonally that if you take uh, 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 just just from not just resistance exercise and building muscle mass, but actually what was more beneficial even than that, w w even than just the muscle uh, resistance training alone, was the supplementation of protein within an hour after exercise actually showed uh, a greater anabolic effect. Uh, than just the, the weight training uh, by itself, okay?